Like one situation we had, we heard of, there was a guy being interrogated, and he eventually had asked for his lawyer, but instead of saying, I will not talk, I want my lawyer, he said, yo, I want my lawyer, dog. And so they said they never gave him one because they weren't sure what he meant. They thought that he could mean the pet of his lawyer, or maybe he had some type of species that was able to practice law. And this is an actual case, this is a real life answer that was given when they were asked why he didn't receive a lawyer. They said they didn't know if, they, if he meant a law, a, part, a person who practices law of pet. And they didn't see how that would benefit the receiving pet. <coughs> so, so, yes, we use examples like that to make sure people do not stray from these words. We understand that some of it is not language you typically use, like I do not consent to this or you know things like that these aren't everyday terms necessarily so we just encourage reading over them practicing them and the easiest way to practice is basically by doing what i'm doing now just telling them to your friends when you when you're done if you're excited about the information you go talk to people you tell them hey i learned this today you say this you say that and just by spreading the information you're practicing the information so you're drilling into your own head okay but now we're all set up so let's let's do this properly my name is Isaiah Dye. I am here on behalf of First Defense Legal Aid. First Defense Legal Aid is a nonprofit organization that's been around for about 20 years now, since like in 1995, 1996. Their, mo their, their, their motivation is to make sure that every person in Chicago has legal representation while being detained by police, because it is your right. Along with that, we provide services like <clears throat> like outreach, outreach events that include things from cookouts, um, food giveaways, neighborhood cleanups, even open mics. We also provide a service which is the the hotline, the the um, first defense hotline, one eight hundred law at four, which is the number you can call if anybody is being detained and is in need of a lawyer. All they would need is a little identifying information, a birthday or name, something so that they can look that person up and meet them at whatever station they're at. And another service we provide is this right here, a teaching, a workshop, which is where we basically make sure you understand those situations and we try to walk you through your rights to make sure everyone is aware. Um, one note I have to throw in, I, I am not a lawyer. I am a certified Know Your Rights teacher. So if you have certain legal questions, I may not be able to answer them, but you can certainly write them down for me. I will pass them along to the lawyers that train me and that I associate with you first defense legal aid and we will have them email you back at the earliest convenience to get you the answers you need. Um, a lot of times when we're dealing with this, people tell us stories and situations that they've dealt with that's greatly encouraged, but I do ask that you use um, hypothetical names in these situations. We don't want to give out people information. We don't know what situations they may be dealing with, and sometimes we don't mean harm, but we say things that can get people in trouble on accident, you know, because if they're dealing with a case, and certain information will leak that can hurt their case, things of that nature. So we always ask for hypothetical situations, even when you want to encourage those stories. Um, okay. So first things first, what typically comes to your mind when you hear police or when you see police? Fear. Fear? Okay. <laughs> Nervous. Nervous. <laughs> Else what do you think, what comes to your mind when you see or hear police? Frustration, sort of fear, danger. Um, it, could be, it could be positive, negative, whatever comes to mind when you hear it. Sorry, I thought you were going to take a question. <laughs> I would say that I also think about those things from their perspective. Mm -hmm. My great-grandfather was a Chicago cop, mm -hmm. and his partner was killed on the job. Right. And I remember how scared he was to So sometimes when I see them, I think this person is afraid as well, mm -hmm. right? So like thinking that I should conduct myself in a friendly manner and kind of smile and be like, okay, yeah, like we're both in a situation where we're like, uh, right, we don't know what can happen. If yeah, you, like if wanting to like kind of diffuse the fear exactly. or diffuse the. That's tension. actually a very good point. 
that's actually one I was gonna make. Um, with hearing with hearing needs, I hear a lot of a lot of different things. There's some rooms I go in, I hear all positive things about police. There's some rooms I go in where I hear things like what I heard, fear, danger, frustration. There's rooms where I go in where I hear much worse. Where it's oh man, I hate them, I seen this, I dealt with this, and I run and all these type of things. And when I hear those type of answers, I try to reach exactly the point you just reached where you just gotta remember that these are people too. They're dealing with situations just as you're dealing with situations. And this is this here is hopefully to try to bridge some of that gap because we're not here to be against police or to provoke those, I mean, to push those energies of negativity. We're here to hopefully disperse some of those energies because now you can leave knowing, okay, these are some of the things I can do in this situation. Instead of being nervous, instead of being frustrated, instead of fearing, instead of being worried about danger, I can relax, take a deep breath, I can use these tools I learned in this workshop, and hopefully it all turns out for the best. So I do thank you for making that point for me. I appreciate it. So, now that we've had the ice broken, we've got the gears out, everybody's spoken a little bit, we from, we friends now, we know each other's names, right, right, we buddy, buddy. So now we're going to learn what we do, okay? So, say you get stopped by police right now, they pull up. Right now, just to ask us a couple questions. What's the first thing that you would try to respond with? Anyone, anyone at all? I guess I would kind of try to figure out like why I'm here. Like, is something wrong, officer? Something or wrong. Did, I, did I do something wrong? Anyone? Else? Yeah. That's that's the most common. That's the most common answer. Mm -hmm. um, Hey, how can I help you? Or why did you stop me? Or what did I do wrong? That's typically a, the most common response I get. Absolutely nothing wrong with the answer, except one thing. The police can't pretty much legally tell you whatever they want, want, want to. So the only problem with that question is it's too open-ended. Mm -hmm. If that, like you said, these are people too. If this is an officer who's negatively motivated for any reason, maybe they've had a long, hard day, Maybe they've been called out to this area multiple times and they're just tired of it or whatever the case may be. So they're trying to see whatever the situation is and they're coming with a, with a negative energy. So you ask them an open-ended question, they're just going to give you an answer that's passable to continue on with their investigation, right? Because it is legal with them. They are trying to get down to the bottom of something. They're trying to understand some answers. So they do have leeway when it comes to that. They can, they can legally lie to you if it's helping them with investigating so that's the only problem with that question. It's fine to want to know what you did wrong. It's actually human to want to know what you did wrong, you know, because you, you're under the belief being raised and being brought up that as long as I'm just sticking to my business, I'm not harming anyone, the police shouldn't bother me, shouldn't stop me. So it's perfectly human to be like, you know, is there a problem, officer, what do I do? But depending on the officer, depending on the day, depending on the situation, it may not even get you any answers at all. It's just going to extend the, the stop. Because you're just going to lead him to saying something that's either going to get him further in the investigation or get you talking more, which is just prolong your stop. So what I what we teach you to say is, am I free to go? You're asking, am I free to go? Because it's a direct question that you actually want to answer to. Do I have to stay here and talk to you, or can I continue my day? And they have to give you a straight-up answer because you only gave them room for yes or no. Mm -hmm. If I tell you no... If I tell you, yes, you're free to go, but I want some questions for you, that wouldn't make sense on my end, right? I just told you you can leave and I didn't get anything out of that. So it wouldn't make sense to lie in this situation. What they might try to do is evade the question, depending on the officer, depending on the day, but you just repeat it. You basically want to get an answer so you know, am I free to go for real? Because if you are not free to go, you are legally being detained. That's what detaining is, right? You cannot leave of your free will. So that's another reason you're asking that direct question. Am I free to go? Because if I'm not free to go, I'm detained right now. And if I'm detained, I need to start invoking my rights to protect myself because I don't know where this situation is going. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Yes. You can, like I said, it's always, these are humans too. You can be courteous. You can be as nice as you want to be. Hey, how you doing, officer? Am I free to go? Hey, it's nice to meet you, officer. I hope you're having a great day. Am I free to go? Hi, um, hi, I was just um, hand, having a great day. How's this weather today? Am I free to go? <laughs> you can be courteous, yeah. you can be kind, you don't have to be rude at all. But yes, I would instantly want to know, am I free to go? Because I want to know, is this my choice to talk to you, or am I being forced to talk to you? 
but those are two different situations. Right. So yeah, that's why we want. That's why I would ask. That's why we teach that you ask that immediately. Yes, sir. Um. So, let's say they say, yeah, you're free to go. I don't. It wasn't nothing that, that important. I was just maybe gonna try to ask a quick question. I don't. Maybe you know I don't have a strong feeling that you know too much. I was just gonna give it a try to you in the neighborhood, right? So. You ask, are you free to go? Well, yeah, you're free to go. Fine, I ain't, I ain't even gonna bother you. What you do is you just walk away calmly, you continue your day. You don't want to run or you know speed up your pace or anything like that because that can look suspicious. You know, I just told you everything's fine. Now you're running off. Now I might want to stop you again because now I was, I do want to interrogate you now. Why did you just run? What are you hiding from me that you just took off? I just told you everything's fine. Why are you running in fear? So you don't want to be suspect. You want to just take your time, continue your day, and go ahead free. If you are not free to go, like I said, you, you are now being detained by definition. So you need to act as such and start protecting yourself, invoking your rights from the, from the very beginning. So the, so the first thing they're going to want to do is figure out who they're talking to. They're going to ask you who are you or ask you for your ID or things of that nature. One thing we tell you, because most people don't know, you do not have to. You do not legally have to give up your information if you are not in the act of committing a crime. If you are not in the act of committing a crime, you do not legally have to receive your, I mean, hand out your information if you're stopped in the street. It's up to you. Now, once again, every decision comes with other things that can happen, other consequences, other pathways. So depending on the day, the officer, his mood, he might want to take you in to try to identify you. To, uh, you know, see if you're in the system, get fingerprints or whatever the case may be. Some people prefer that because they prefer a group of officers to witness them as opposed to handling them with one officer on the street or whatever the case may be. So some people do take that chance or whatever because either you're going to let me go because you don't know who I am and you don't have a strong reason to find out who I am or you're going to take me in with as a bunch of witnesses. Well, okay, well now I'm comfortable expressing my information because if you are an officer that's having a bad day or that's going to be aggressive with me, now there are other people there, there are supervisors there, I'm more comfortable in that situation. So those are the two choices, but you do not legally, just by law, have to give out your information unless you're comfortable. Unless you feel like, okay, he came in calm, he seems like he's cool, he doesn't seem like he wants trouble, I'm not going to start any trouble. Let me go ahead and give him my information because I'm not in the process of doing anything wrong. So those are your two options. If you do choose the latter, I'm going to go ahead and give him my information to make this go smooth. It seems like, it seems like a smooth transaction. I'm going to go ahead and give him my name so this can be over with, then we advise that you only stick to the information that will be on your ID, your name, your address, a birth date, and well, we're all adults here, but for people under 17, a legal guardian, because you do want your parents to be contacted, you know, let them know what's going on with you, you don't want them worried about you, you might have supposed to be at home at a certain time, or be at a certain place at a certain time, if you're not going to be there, you definitely want them to know, and if you are in any, as a youngster, if you are in any type of trouble, you want your parents to get in contact with First Defense Legal Aid or whatever lawyer you do have on um, retain or whatever your situation may be. So we limit it to this information just, once again, for safety. We don't know what this officer is looking for. You might have just left, a, you might have just left an area where a crime occurred. You don't know anything about the crime, but you just left that area is now well within my means as an officer to try to see if you saw anything suspicious. You might have, like I, like we said, like I said earlier about the hypothetical, you might give out information that can be harmful to certain people. It's the same situation. You might have saw something you don't know you saw, so just because you were in that area, now they want to ask you a, question, a couple questions. Well, you didn't see anything like this. Nobody walked like that. Nobody did this, that, and the third. You ain't see a person in, in this particular outfit or whatever the case may be. So... Unless you're prepared to stand there and give up all these type of information and accept all these type of questions, we want to limit the information to just an act, just identifying information, your address, your name, your birthday. Um, so let's say this isn't enough. For whatever reason, this isn't enough. You know, you told me who you are. Um, you asked are you free to go. I still told you, no, you told me who you are, and I still want to continue with this interrogation. If we deal with prolonged stops, then most officers will give you a pat down for police safety. Um, can I get a, a male volunteer real quick? Any, any male? Sure, go ahead. 
<laughs> okay, okay. So look. So here we go. We're gonna hold his arms out like this. This is what a proper pat down should look like. He's just gonna pat you down. Exterior clothes. What he's basically looking for is anything that can poke, pry, or a large object. Anything you can use as a weapon during the interrogation. Now, what we always teach is to invoke your right at this point. I do not consent to any searches. You're invoking his right to make sure that you're protected as well as him. The officer is using his right to pat you down to protect himself. You're using your right to protect yourself. You're making sure that if he was to do something like lift your shirt up, put his hand in your pocket, things like that, those are illegal searches. So if you say, I do not consent to a search, and he does these things, this is information you hand out to your lawyer later on because you do not want to end up in a situation where you're arguing with an officer on the street. Escalated encounters with the police are never going to go right and in a civilian's matter. It's just, you know, getting getting too belligerent and aggressive with them is not what we is not what we advise at all. But we do advise you always invoke your rights. You remember you invoke your rights. If for whatever reason your rights are violated, especially after you invoke them, we suggest you repeat them. You use an escalated voice, not aggressive, but a louder voice. I do not consent to any searches. You want witnesses around to hear you consent to, to hear you invoking your rights to notice that your rights are being violated. Hopefully, if they're if they're the types to you know record and protect others, they're gonna stop. They're gonna see what's going on because that is also legal. These are civil servants. It is legal to watch a civil servant do their job from a safe distance. So if you decide to stop and watch, that is perfectly legal. So if you have your rights being violated, we say you know use an escalated voice. See if you can get a crowd. See if you can get some witnesses. Because if your rights are being violated, that's going to be helpful to you. It's going to be helpful to your lawyer. It's going to be helpful if a case ensues from this encounter that you have witnesses noticing you invoke your rights. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we're stopped in the street. We're being asked some questions. You know, we we said, no, uh, you're not free to go. We need to ask you some questions. A crime just happened in this area. Can you identify yourself? So we say, okay, sure. Here's my ID info or tell you my name and address mm -hmm. and then they say well since this is a prolonged stop we need to pat you down now is that legal the pat down part or is the whole pat down not legal because it's a search or is it only like if they go in your pocket and says like lift up your shirt yeah as long as the as long as the pat down stays on the exterior of your clothes then yes the pat down, down is legal for police safety but so they just make like i said they're just making sure that when they pat your clothes they don't feel any like a gun or a knife, a bag, something you can use as a weapon. If they don't feel something obvious like that, then yes, that is completely legal because that's just police safety. But if they start to, like, like say they pat down, they don't feel nothing, but they still lift your leg and they want to see if you got anything in your shoe. Or let's say they do one of these to see if you, all those things are illegal searches, okay. especially if you invoke your rights. Now, this is one thing I want to get to now that you've asked that question. If you do not invoke your rights, what you did do was give them something called implied consent. So then it becomes legal. Mm -hmm. So if they come and they pat you down and you decide you're not going to say anything, you're just going to be quiet and you're going to allow them to do that pat down because the pat down is legal. But now you didn't say anything. You did, you did not tell me that I cannot search you. So you gave me implied consent. I can give up, especially so now. Say I go in your pocket now and you haven't said I do not consent to a search. This is now... You have not given me implied consent. You haven't said I do not consent to a search. You haven't made any, you know, done anything to stop. And of course, you don't want to snatch away. That's resisting arrest. That's obstructing justice. It's something that's going to get you in trouble. So what you have to do is invoke your right to not give up that implied consent. Um, let's see. So okay, so we went over. Am I free to go? You asking yes. You asking a yes or no question, a straight up question to know, am I choosing to talk to you or am I being forced to talk to you? Because if I cannot leave with my free will, by definition, I am being detained. If I'm being detained, I should start invoking my rights to protect myself. I have no idea where this encounter is going, so I'm going to be as safe as possible. Am I free to go is our first key word, magic word, how, whichever one makes it stand out in your mind. <laughs> our second one is limited information or basically name, address, birthday. Those are the second key words. 
limit the information that you give out to police that you identify yourself with only. And the third one, I do not consent to any searches. So like we said, a pat down for police safety doesn't become a full search where I'm going in your pockets, or I'm asking you to kick off shoes, or I'm asking what you're carrying here and there. And our, our next one is I will not talk, I want my lawyer. That is for if any reason I have not patted you down, you have no weapon, I've identified you, I know exactly who you are, I've asked you a couple questions, I've tried to ask you a couple questions or whatever the case may be, and either you decided not to give me in, any information and I believe you have it, or you have given me what you say you have and I don't believe you or whatever the case may be. For whatever reason, I believe I can get more information out of you. So I decided to take you down to the station for a quick interrogation. At this point, this is why you say, I will not talk, I want my lawyer. You are invoking your Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. Your Fifth Amendment right is just dumbed down, your right to protect, the right to not tell on yourself. You know, you have the right to not say you did it. That is your right. If you don't want to say, I did this, you don't have to say you did it. If you don't want to, if you know something happened in that area, you didn't have nothing to do with it, but you know you were in that area, you have the right to not put yourself in that room. You have the right to not incriminate yourself. That's your Fifth Amendment right. I will not talk. Your Sixth Amendment, your, ooh, I'm sorry. Fourth. Yes, your, no, it is six. Your Sixth Amendment right is for legal counsel. If you're being detained, you have the right to have legal counsel there to represent you and to protect you. So that's where I will, I want my lawyer. So you're combining those two rights and invoking them at the same time. I will not talk. I want my lawyer. At this point, they should now stop questioning you because information they receive from you can be argued later to be um, falsely obtained and obtained under false pretenses and things of that nature because you did ask for your lawyer. I will not talk. I want my lawyer. But this is very, this is a very shifty term because it can be taken away and given and given back at any time because it's just your right to talk or not to talk. So you can always rescind it and you can always be tricked into rescinding it. Because once you, once you reinsert yourself in conversation, you feel you just took back that you said you will not talk. You said you will not talk. So if you're talking to me again, you just took that back. So let's give an example. Say, like I said, he believes you have some inf he or she believes you have some information. So they just sit you in the room. They don't give they don't rush to the interrogation. They sit you in the room for maybe 30, 40 minutes before they come talk to you. Just let you let you sit there for a while, think about it, be nervous, whatever case they whatever situation they trying to bring about to get their answers. So you sitting there for 30, 30, 40 minutes, it's a hot day like this, you thirsty. You told them you will not talk, you want no you want your lawyer before they come before they left you in the room. Your lawyer hasn't gotten there yet. But you thirsty. So when they come back into the room to check on you, you tell them that. Hey man, it's a hot day, you mind if I get a cup of water? Well now you just start a conversation. So, yeah, I got a partner. Hey bro, go ahead and grab him a cup of water. Now I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna ask you a question. Remember when I uh picked you up, man, how you feeling now? You want to talk about this, that, and the third now? Because now you just opened up conversation. So now you have to re-invoke your right. I will not talk. I want my lawyer. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And that's how, that's how your rights work. That your rights. You invoke them. You don't invoke them. So that's why the implied consent thing comes, comes into play. If I'm patting you down for my safety as a police officer, and I go in your pockets and you don't tell me, you don't consent to a search, that was your right to either tell me or not tell me. That was your that was your choice to invoke. And it's the same thing with I will not talk, I want my lawyer. You have to re-invoke and then you have to do what we call our last magic word, remain silent. You have to, I will not talk, I want my lawyer, and then until your lawyer gets there. Like I said, we're all human. We get hungry, we get thirsty, we need party breaks. Ask for those things. It's your legal right to get them. But once you ask for them, I will not talk, I want my lawyer. To let you know, to let them know, that was all I'm talking about. I need this bathroom, I need this food, I need this water, whatever, blah, blah, blah. 
I would not talk about my lawyer. And what if you don't have a lawyer? Do you have to call someone for you? Everybody has a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Why you don't have a lawyer? I can so you it. just tell them that number? No, you dial his number. Okay. Now, okay, now this is tricky too. Yep, I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you. This is another tricky situation because legally, you have the right to you have the right to a reasonable a reasonable amount of calls in a reasonable amount of time. So that means, depending on my mood, my day, when is it reasonable? You've been in there 15 minutes. Is it now reasonable for you to call somebody? We've been talking to him for an hour. Is it reasonable now for me to call somebody? What's reasonable? It depends on that person, right? So this is why I gave out two cards. This is why I stretched that. This is why we always stretch the calling for another and helping another because we don't know what reasonable is. What we will hope is that whoever you are with or whoever is around you has these cards and they can call for you so that your attorney can be there within that 60 minutes. Because all a person needs to get you an attorney is that number, your name, and maybe a birthday, your legal name and a birthday. So they can look you up in the system, find out where you were taken, and they can meet you there. But say no one does have that number, then yeah, you would you would request your call. That would be another I would not talk, I want my lawyer situation. You sitting there for a second, hey, when do I receive my phone call so I can call my lawyer? I would not talk, I want my lawyer. Hey, I haven't been able to contact my lawyer yet. Can I get in touch with him? I will not talk to my lawyer. That would be one of those situations. You request your call until you receive your call. You re-invoke your rights until you receive your call and after you receive your call. Once you get your call, you call the 1-800-LAW-REP-4, 1-800-529-7374. And you're explaining your situation. Hey, I'm down at the police station. I was taken in. My name is so-and-so, so-and-so. I didn't have anyone to call for me, so I'm just calling for myself on my call. Somebody will come down there. The, um, they're going to have a piece of paper for you to sign that basically says you invoked your rights, which they're going to believe you did because you called this number and you sat through a workshop and you were taught your rights. So we will hope you're not being taught information and not use it. You know, Mine's a terrible thing to waste, you know? <laughs> so they're going to come in, they're going to make sure you invoke your rights, and then they're going to handle the situation as, as best they can and get you back home as quick as possible. We're going to hope that you invoke everything and they have no information on you. So, I mean, no negative information on you. So, you're going to be going home and relaxing yourself, you know, going on about your life. Any other questions? Sure, yeah. I think of particular interest in the street. And first, I want to say thanks for covering all these things about street stops. But I think of particular interest to this group is invoking your rights in private property. Okay. Um, let's say you're having an event in your house and the police mm -hmm. come about a noise complaint. But then things start to go south. What can you do? What are your rights? Who can you refuse to let in your home? Um, where does public assembly end and uh, public nuisance begin? And that, that may be to the judgment of one particular officer that's making the house call, but uh, what can we do to mitigate those kind of situations? I think that's particularly what we're looking to link to that. Yeah, um, actually, Erica did mention something about that. I'm glad you brought it back up. Um, as far as, like you said, with like public assembly and public nuisance, that's definitely a thin line that's going to be brought up by that. It's going to be determined by the person who's receiving that call at that day. So it's it's kind of hard to ask to, because uh, because of the way the law is written, all situations are very black and white. That's why I made sure I told early that some questions were going to have to get written down and make sure they get received back to you. As far as your home, it may not be. No, I'm just 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 as one example. Just like as if the event is in your home, then yes, unless you're unless you're in the unless that person has a warrant, they don't really have the right to enter your home without your consent. So if the event is being thrown at a person's home, then the homeowner should be um, sent to the door. If it's um, a rented property or whatever, the leaser should be at the, should be sent to the door. Um, I would say try to be courteous because, like you said, you don't want the store to go, the uh, the stop to go south or the the meeting to go south. You want to try to keep it as cordial as possible because you don't want it to be shut down or whatever the case may be. Um, you ask, you ask whatever the problem is. You say, you ask whatever the problem is. You just be courteous and tell them you'll try to keep it down if that's the issue. 
and then you, like I said, you just try to you just try to be as courteous as possible because you don't have to legally invite a per- an officer into your house if you don't want to, and if all they're there for is like a noise complaint or something like that, that's not really enough to judge, unless it's a dangerous noise. Unless they say, "Oh, we heard screaming from next door," or "We heard gunfire from next door," or "Loud booms." It could be fireworks, but we heard loud booms from next door. Unless it's something that can be seen as a danger, if they're just calling about loud music or uh, running the meal noise complaint, that's not enough for them to forcibly enter your home. What? Uh, what are the? What's the, What are the boundaries of forcibly? I mean, if your door is unlocked, is that still forcible entry? If uh, if the officer comes to your house and you don't have a peephole in your door, can you leave it uh, chain locked while you speak to the officer? Can you speak to the officer through the door? Uh, I've, I've just been in a situation where something like this happened. Oh, yes, I, I happened. completely understand. Um, um, the door being open, that's going to be arguable between the lawyers and the officers because that can fall under implied consent. It's a possibility that that could fall under implied consent. The door was left open. Um, a jar? Or, or it could also um, fall under, even if not, um, or like if it's like cracked open or if it's unlocked, mm-hmm. it can be seen as either implied consent, possibly, because it's open, they were letting people in. Mm-hmm. Or it could be seen as they, they were called there, mm-hmm. it was a noise complaint, and now doors open, we thought we should go ahead and investigate mm-hmm. because we were called onto scene. So an open, a cracked door or an unlocked door could be argued. Yeah. So is it best to step outside and close and lock your door behind you? Um, if the police are knocking on the door and you have your curtain, should you, and it's my house or I'm a renter or whatever? No, I would more advise, I would more advise the the talking through the open door situation. What I would basically, what I'm basically saying is, I would hope the door is not already open. I would hope they have to ring a bell or a knock on the door oh, and, not leave it open and, and not just be able to enter. Right. I would hope the door is not just open unattended. But if they had to knock on the door and ring the bell, yes, it's perfectly legal. If you want to leave it locked or whatever, because they don't have, like I said, if they're just coming from a run the mill noise complaint, that's not enough for them to need to be in your house necessarily, unless you're comfortable with them coming in your house. So yes, you can open it and talk to them through the crack, or you can leave it locked or whatever the case may be through the, um, if you have the, the chain lock, you can you can talk to them through that. Because like I said, it's, it's all about the call. If they didn't, unless they heard something dangerous, I heard booms, I heard screams, things of that nature, then it typically shouldn't be enough for them to have to come in unless they get there and then feel like it's a need. So like I said, if they just if it's a run the mill call and they get there and you're courteous, maybe turn the music down while they're there so you can have a, a clear conversation where they don't have to feel like they have to raise their voice and repeat themselves a lot. Because just typically when you're dealing with somebody, they have a better chance to get what they want from you the more comfortable you are, right? So while they're there, be be courteous, try to make them comfortable, let them know there is no need for them. We didn't know we were bothering people. We're We'll try to keep it down. We'll cut down music, whatever the case may be, officer. I do apologize that you had to come out here. You know, you just try to be courteous and you try to defuse it quickly. Because, like I said, we're hoping it's just a run-of-the-mill call. That's about as deep as I can get into it, because anything deeper than that, I'll be getting into legal jargon, which, like I said at the beginning, I'm not legally trained to do that much, that far sure. up. Yeah. If you have something deeper than that, like I said, please write it down. I'm going to hand it to a lawyer immediately as soon as I can, email it to them or anything, and hopefully they get it back to you quick. I guess one further follow-up is, let's say there's a situation where you you, know, you open the door uh, to address police a crack so that you can speak to them. They force the door open, and that's a pretty questionable entry. What, what kind of legal recourse should you take afterwards, if you're, especially if you're not able to document it? If, it's, if you think you're having just a, a regular conversation through a door and suddenly your home has been forcibly entered, uh, what do you do next? Who do you speak to after after the police interaction is over? Yeah. What can you do? Okay, these are situ- in this situation, I would advise you know filing your complaint. You have to you have to go down to the station. Um, I would say the nearest station to your home. Try to get you a badge number or officer's name, and you go about all the all the necessary steps of of invoking your rights once you're in once they're in because they still don't have. 
like I said, it's gonna be arguable. That's gonna be it's definitely gonna be arguable. Um, if you have some witnesses, that's gonna help you out too. You go down, you file your complaint. Anybody that's agreed to share the information, um, write their names on the complaint as witnesses, and then you just go through all the proper channels because that's definitely that in my eyes definitely seems like a forcible entry, and a lot of that should be able to to go in your favor, in my opinion. Can you still say, would you still say these things? Like, I do not consent to any searches? Yes, you definitely still not consent to any searches. And any is a definitely a key word, especially in situations like them. Because what can happen is they can they can't search the situation. They can look around the area. This is, especially for on the street situations, they can look around the area and try to attach those things to you. And if they are in your home, typically... There are plain sight rules that um, apply. Anything I can see in plain sight does not count as a search. But I shouldn't have the right to go in drawers and do all these type of things, you feel me? Um, if we're under a questionable situation as it is, then you got to remember that we don't want to have altercations with the police. We don't want to do things that they can see as, as <coughs> harmful or dangerous toward them or resisting because you don't want to escalate the situation, but you do just want to try to keep invoking all your rights. Um, if anybody has a phone out or something like that, you try to record the situation as best you can to have some documentation for you. And like I said, you take that that video if you have it, any witnesses you have, and you go down to the police station and you file your complaint, you take it through the proper channels. Um, me, myself, I haven't had a situation since I've learned my training where I had to file a complaint, so I'm not sure how long the process goes. I'm not sure once you, I know you go down to the station, you file it, you um, try to get the, if you have the names, you write their names down in their bag number, you write your name at the complaint and all the witnesses and whatever information you have. I don't know how long it takes to start receiving um, doc, um, information back or contacts back, but that would be the, proper way to handle it. You just try to keep it courteous. You try not to make them feel at harm in any way. You invoke all your rights. You try to get your witnesses that were there that want to help you out. And if anybody has a phone, you try to get you a video because that's some of the best documentation some, right now. That video is helping a lot of cases. And I would just hope for the, the very best in all situations. Make sure that you do call first defense if anyone is taken down, if anyone is taken out of the house for any situation, make sure first defense is called to them. And just because of that, I'm sure that, you know, somebody would be there that, that cares about them, they're going to mess around, they're going to probably want to go to the station to check on them and all those type of situations. Those would be great times to try to file your complaint. But now you already have witnesses there, it's fresh in your mind. You don't want to go and give a lot of negative energy, especially to the person you're complaining to, because they weren't there. But you definitely want to get to why it's fresh. This just happened. One of my one of my friends is back there right now. We weren't doing anything, or whatever the case may be. You get your side of the story out there. Yeah, related to follow up, like you you were saying in those situations, just make sure you can invoke your rights. Is one of your rights in that situation like, am I free to go? Like they knock on your door and you say, and they say, hey, the noise is too loud, and you say, oh my god. We'll absolutely turn that down. No problem. Am I free to go? And then, like, closing the door. <laughs> you know, like, um, I mean, I would say it's not the most common way to end the conversation when you're inside the house. But yes, it's, it would be a fine <laughs> way. Yeah, but like, just like curious no, about yeah, how to end like, that would, situation. Yeah, like it like, would work. I believe it would work. Am I free to go? Because you're asking, like I said earlier, am I done with this conversation? Do you have? You're basically asking the officer. Am I good to leave this this conversation? So yeah, it would fit. Like I said, it would just seem odd because you're on the inside of the door. Yeah. But yeah, it, it would definitely work. It would work just fine. In those situations, I usually just say goodbye and uh, <laughs> right. I'd like I'm to like, know if, in, if they need anything else. Yeah, yeah. It's typically if they need anything else, they'll knock again or whatever the case may be. But sure. yeah, if you if you <laughs> felt like okay, let me go ahead and throw in one more key phrase for them. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> it, would, it would be perfectly within like, your rights and it would be perfectly legal and it would not be rude. Yeah. So, yeah, that's perfectly okay. Yeah. Or goodbye will work too, either one. <laughs> um, I have one question. I'm just curious to see how many other people know who actually are. Okay, great. So, I guess this will be the last question. Um, and yeah, I guess.
here or there. Wisconsin is pretty close. I figure people at this workshop might encounter police in other states. Who should they call? Is this phone number work, or do you have another answer you could call? Um, that, that one is a tough one. Right now, we there are some states that have leaked particular information about what the folks that are doing out there. There are some states that have similar resources, like um, we met up with one in New Orleans. Um, I contacted with one with one guy, I can't remember his name right now, but they have a similar program in California. So there are some states that have it, but it would be more just reaching out to them. We do have our thing now going on, our new program now, which would be the Help of Jail. That's what that promotion is. So you can reach out to us and see if if we have outreach with anybody yet that we can connect you to. Because what we're doing now is you can call and say, hey, um, this incident is going on. I need this type of resource. Do you guys have anyone I can anywhere I can go for that? Because what we're coming to find, what we're coming into situations is there are people who are being placed in jail for just civil things not having the right resources, not knowing where to go, and just basically lack of information. So we are trying to outreach at this moment. We're trying to find out more situations, and I mean more groups who are doing these type of work, but it's still just spreading. So it'll be more just calling, and they're going to give you the most information we can to get you on the right path. And depending on what state you are in, then yeah, there's, there's one out there. We just have to reach them. Now, if the number, they can't help you. Is there anyone that you would recommend getting in touch with? Family member, friend, is there a good go-to that someone can help you in that situation? Um, maybe court carpools. Um, that's a, a nice legal resource. You can you call them and um, you can ask them a legal, a legal questions or do they have other outreach acts because they do a similar thing and they've been around a little bit longer. We've been doing this for about two or three years. And they've been doing it a little longer, so Carpools is one you can outreach to. Um, who would be another good one? Um, you know, I would probably, just because I don't want to miss anyone, that would be another question that I would actually like written down. Yeah. Because I could, that way I could send it, get a list of all the, the people we network mm -hmm. with that can be resources, and then I can email the list to you, so I wouldn't leave anybody out. If anyone wants to write a question down, you can write a notebook at the front table. Feel free to oh, yes, please do. If anyone had a legal question that, you know, I couldn't answer or that they feel like I wouldn't, or that they feel like they, even if it's something you just didn't want to say out loud, maybe it's something you're dealing with personally and you want to see if you can get a question about it, please write it down. I'm going to pass it down to one of my attorneys. Oh, write it down with an email or a contact so I can pass it on to one of my attorneys and they can get it back to you at their earliest convenience. Because, as you see, just from the fact that we do these type of workshops, we definitely want to spread any type of knowledge we can and help in any way we can. So we definitely want to get you these questions answered and try to help you guys out. Because the last thing we want is people having events, something we do, and your events are getting busted out and people are getting taken to jail. Like, mm -hmm. Because we're outreaching, because we're playing some music, because we're teaching this, that, and the third. You know, So we definitely want to help in any way we can. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me. I appreciate this teaching. You guys are definitely engaged. I love it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Well, like I said, write down any questions you have in your notebook at the front. We'll give it to Isaiah on his way out. Oh, this was yeah. This was a sign-in sheet. Oh, if anybody wants to sign in, please do. That would actually help too. If you guys have questions you want to write down. If